Todd, I've been very much looking forward to this conversation. We've got a lot to talk about. There is. So let's talk about you first and your background, then we're going to get into what you know, which is quite a bit and uh, could be somewhat controversial in this world. So how did you get into doing what you're doing right now? Well, I've been a self-employed entrepreneur since I was 17, mm -hmm. and I've created a number of different businesses. About five years ago, I decided to, I've been a lifelong biohacker. Mm -hmm. So I've been experimenting with diet and other biohacks since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. I, about five years ago, decided to experiment with a ketogenic diet mm -hmm. and then consequently intermittent and extended fasting. Mm -hmm. uh, when I don't know if it was a combination of aging or if it was the pretty radical change in my diet or a combination of cofactors, but mm -hmm. I couldn't drink standard wines anymore. I couldn't drink conventional wines like what you would see in your wine store or in the grocery store. I live in the heart of Napa Valley, mm -hmm. and so I drink a lot of wine, drank a lot of wine. I've been drinking wine since I was nine years old. Wow. So I didn't take this news very well. And Why couldn't you, though? What was happening when you say you couldn't drink I anymore? I wasn't able to process it. I was feeling bad. I was getting kind of drunk or easier, having hangovers, mm -hmm. brain fog in the morning. Mm -hmm. Just found that I just couldn't drink and feel well. So initially... I thought it was just higher alcohol because alcohol has been rising in wines internationally over the mm -hmm. last 30 years. And there's a number of reasons for that, mm -hmm. which we can talk about why alcohol has been rising and why the industry likes, why the wine industry likes higher alcohol. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but so anyway, I started, it was during the winter time and I started dosing down. So I was actually making a kind of a malt tea like thing mm -hmm. with wine uh, and just using like an ounce of wine and a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And I felt materially mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was just the higher alcohol. Uh, but as it turns out, there was a lot more going on that I didn't know about, mm -hmm. which we're going to talk about today. Good. So that was, so I started experimenting and from there, I accidentally stumbled upon the natural wine revolution which five years ago was just about getting started. Right. How would you describe that revolution? Well, natural winemaking is a very specific protocol mm -hmm. of growing and then fermentation practices. Mm -hmm. And so natural wine doesn't have a certification or any international standard, uh -huh. but more or less. Now, Dry Farm Wines, my company, does have a certification process, okay. and our certification process is over and beyond just natural. Okay. But natural wines more or less are accepted as being organically or biodynamically grown, mm -hmm. uh, fermented with wild native indigenous yeast. Mm -hmm. Most commercial wines are fermented with lab-grown, genetically modified, uh, cultured yeast. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that we can talk about. And then little or no additives or manipulation. And the only additive that can go into a natural wine is a very small dose of sulfur dioxide mm -hmm. at the time of bottling, typically five or 10 milligrams, mm -hmm. uh, which will result in uh, 10 parts per million of sulfur. Now, most people probably know that sulfites are naturally occurring in all wines. Mm -hmm. So whether you add sulfur dioxide and how much sulfur dioxide you add mm -hmm. really defines then whether or not it is a natural wine or a conventional wine because conventional wines get a much larger dose that actually sterilizes the wine. Mm -hmm. It also kills the gut-friendly bacteria and other living bacteria that are alive in natural wines. Commercial wines have been sterilized with sulfur dioxide. I mean, I see on labels sometimes no added sulfites. So that's, is that what they mean? They're just whatever naturally is occurring is all they're using. That's correct. And you're saying if they use small amounts, and this is just kind of as a preservative, or what's the use? Why would they want to add? Well, it stabilizes the wine. So like in our case, mm -hmm. and I would say for natural wine makers, probably it's 60, 40, mm -hmm. 70, 30 that use a little bit of sulfur at the time of bottling to right. stabilize the wine. It does not sterilize it. So this is, a, this, is, this is where the difference in concept comes in between a commercial wine and a natural wine where sulfur dioxide is concerned, mm -hmm. whether the sulfur dioxide dose is large enough to sterilize the wine. Right. Right. And sterilize mean kill all the bacteria? Kill, kill everything alive in the bottle, mm -hmm. guarantee that it's going to be shelf, shelf worthy. Right. And that it's also going to create... When we, when we talk about killing a wine mm -hmm. with sulfur dioxide, we talk about mummifying the wine. Mm -hmm. So then it also becomes McDonaldized. Okay? What does that mean? Well, what that means is that you're going to have a consistent taste from bottle to bottle. Uh. 
vintage to vintage. It's just, you mm. know, it's, it's, you're going to have this kind of shelf consistent taste. Yep. It's going to be, it's particularly bottle to bottle. So No vintage variation at all. Well, you'll have vintage vari- variation based on the weather, but but you won't have variation based in these flavor profiles, okay? right? And then no bottle-to-bottle variation mm-hmm. when you sterilize a wine. A, a natural wine, a living wine that's still alive with bacteria, you can very often have you know, bottle-to-bottle variation. So Within the same vintage? Within the same case. Yeah, oh, wow, right? okay. Right, not, not, not often, but mm-hmm. it can happen mm-hmm. because they've not been sort of McDonaldized mm-hmm. in this way Got for it. this consistent super expected taste because americans well, pe- people all over the globe but americans buy wine mm-hmm. based on brand yeah based on advertising and story right mm-hmm. like you know robert mandavi mm-hmm. you know famed vintner in the napa valley well the fact of the matter is that robert mandavi vineyards is owned by constellation brand yes you know which is the second largest wine producer in the world right and right. they're a public company. Right. Big public company. Yeah. The other thing that's happened in our wine supply is the same mm-hmm. thing that's happened in our food supply. Mm-hmm. It's been massive corporate consolidation. Right. Mm-hmm. So in the United States, 52% of all the wines manufactured in the United States are made mm-hmm. by just three giant conglomerates. Mm-hmm. And the top 30 companies make over 70% of U.S. wines. Mm-hmm. And so you've got this massive corporate consolidation. Now, you don't know about that as a drinker. hmm and the reason you don't know about it is because these, these guys that do this, they're very clever, right? And so they hide behind tens of thousands of labels and brands right. to have you believe that you're drinking from a chateau or a farmhouse, when in fact you're drinking from massive factories in Central California. Well, what's interesting um, is that Mondavi and many of these other were actually family-owned wineries that you know, were built by these families, but then they sold out. And I think Constellation especially has been very um, astute about just maintaining the brand, maintaining the look and the feel, not making it look like it's been a conglomerate, you know, that's, that the, the Borg the very you know, absorbed another one, but they're trying to make it just seem like nothing's changed and it's the same old family story, et cetera. Except the volume has changed, right? Yeah. And when the volume changes, you can't have those same old world winemaking techniques. Right. You know, when you're producing millions of cases, right. it just doesn't work that yeah. way. You can't make wine in this kind of volume without the use of additives and adjustments. Yeah. And the investment has to be somewhat around economies of scale, right? Saying, hey, we got all these different wineries. We can kind of uh, create scale by doing the types of things you're talking about to make our investment worthwhile. Right. Yeah. So, on. Uh, you know, I mean, it's worth noting that Constellation paid $1.2 billion for, for the Monavi wine. And that was... Some fifteen years ago. Yep, I remember right. when the transaction and happened. So, yeah, and know, I think, I think Opus and I think today. Opus went in that uh, transaction, it did. didn't it? it so, did. yeah, so Opus is a part of Constellation Brands. It now. did. So, um, finishing though the natural wine attributes. So you're saying you know little to no added sulfites. Um, you know, plus organically grown uh, or grapes, biodynamic or biodynamic. Uh, plus um, that the my, uh, additives in the winemaking practice, so a little bit of sulfates, and is there any other attributes? None. None. Okay, None. that's so full story. So we don't really talk about wine making, mm-hmm. really. We talk about wine growing. Mm-hmm. Because when a wine is grown, the wine is grown in the vineyard. Right. What happens in the cellar mm-hmm. is a natural process. Right. As long as you're using native wild yeast. You're right. Right, which are temperamental mm-hmm. and difficult to work with. And the reason that commercial winemakers use these lab-grown, genetically modified yeast is because they're sturdier, mm-hmm. they are they're are easier to work with, they're not as temperamental, they will also withstand a higher alcohol environment, mm-hmm. and, and just right on the package, it'll say, well, you know, this yeast will withstand an alcohol up to 18%. Wow. Right? And the third reason they use these genetically modified lab-cultured yeast is because you can buy these yeasts to create flavor profiles. Mm-hmm. So let's say that you grow this kind of industrial crappy grape in Central California, and you want it to taste like it's from the Mediterranean. There's yeast for that, mm-hmm. right? So those are the three reasons that commercial yeast are almost always favored. Right. And also with, with the wild indigenous yeast, you can't make wine in very great volumes with it. Right. It's just too temperamental. Well, in our exploration, I mean, uh, one of the things that we found visiting a lot of these family-owned vineyards is uh, they would offer the representation. I didn't ask. Uh, you know, we use 
wild yeast, you know, right from the vineyard. We're not using, you know, so they, they, it's something that they know about, something they're sensitive to and something that they're, they're promulgating as far as why our wine is special, or at least one of the attributes. It's a big deal. I mean, it's, we don't know what it means from a health point of view. Mm -hmm. We do know that typically when you drink these wines that are made in this way, you feel better. Yeah. There's just no research to support. We don't know what the native yeast means to our health, but, and health is a big focus of what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not just you know, the largest natural wine seller in the world. We're mm. the only health quantified wine merchant in the world. So we do independent lab testing and we have a whole criteria around how we assess a wine, mm -hmm. not only from its aesthetic and its heritage, but also from a lab analysis that's done independently by us. So what I find interesting uh, in your story personally is kind of what drove you here saying, hey, I, I started feeling bad. I'm hearing that story over and over again I mean, everywhere I look, and it's my story now too. So I, and I started to contemplate. Now I've, I've been in Napa Valley countless times over the past 30 years. Um, all over that valley tasted, built a cellar out of it. And you know, if I remember going back in the 90s, for example, and consuming those wines, I'm like, I never had an issue then. I never noticed anything. And then I started to wonder, geez, is it just, you know, I'm getting older, maybe I'm more sensitive, I'm less tolerant. Or I'm wondering, is there something different about the wine? Which incidentally, I feel like from just my palate point of view, the wines have been built differently. There's a, there's a profile on them that's like just like that sort of cheap in, instant gratification. I don't want to overgeneralize. I'm not saying it's every winery, but many of the ones that I've known for a lot of years. Um, and but then I'm hearing a lot of other people who are younger than me <laughs> by decades saying, "Oh, I can't, I can't," and they say this, "I can't drink." wine or I can't drink red wine because I get such a bad headache, I have such a bad hangover, et cetera. And I'm realizing, well, wait a minute, they're young. They're not, they're not older like me. They're in their twenties maybe. Why are they having that problem? So long way to ask the question, has something changed in the past 20 years? Have they been adding things into wines in these new world wines that are causing these health outcomes for people who are consuming them? There's a whole lot that's going on. It started in the 1970s with irrigation. Mm -hmm. So as you may know, I mean, it's against the law in most of Europe to irrigate a grapevine. Right. Uh, now, California wine growers will tell you that you can't grow a grape in California without irrigation. And even at the University of California at Davis, mm -hmm. which is the primary analogy school in North America, even the professors there will tell you that you can't grow dry farming in California. That's simply not true. There are and, and let's let's define that term dry farming. So dry farming means growing a crop without irrigated without water. Without any irrigation. There's a whole bunch of problems with irrigation. Yeah. But one of the problems with irrigation is that because the grape berry is filled with water, mm -hmm. you have to pick it later mm -hmm. and higher in sugar, mm -hmm. which then creates a higher alcohol product. So mm -hmm. the higher the sugar or bricks at the time of picking will determine the outcome of the alcohol at the end of fermentation. Right. More sugar, higher alcohol. Right. So higher alcohol has been one of the things that are contributing to how you feel. Alcohol is a dangerous neurotoxin mm -hmm. and a destructive drug. Mm -hmm. And we need to treat it with caution and care. Right. And so, which is why I only drink and I sell and promote mm -hmm. lower alcohol wines. What's the upper limit? 12.5% for us. So for you, basically, that's the top. If anything goes over 12.5%, it's out of your out of your Right, mind. and we lab test for alcohol mm -hmm. because... You don't trust the label. Well, the label is not required to be accurate under the law. Oh. And so there's a number of collusions we'll talk about between the wine industry and the U.S. government. But this is one of them. Okay. So by law, even, even though it's not enforced at all anyway... Mm -hmm. So you could pr pretty much put whatever you want on it. There's no enforcement. But you can misrepresent on a label under legally? the law. Yeah, if it says 14 percent under the label on the label of the wine, it's called stated alcohol. It's not required to be accurate. The term is stated. If you state 14 percent on the bottle, it can legally be as high as 15 and a half percent. Wow, that's right. a, that's a. I mean, so there's no truth in labeling around this. It's just basically saying, yeah, we think it's about this. It's an estimate. <laughs> well, there's a reason for that. There's mm -hmm. a reason why this variance, this law was written like most alcohol laws in the United States were written post prohibition mm -hmm. in the 1940s, right? Mm -hmm. And so at that time, 
you the alcohol measuring standards at labs could vary from lab to lab. I see. Right? Today it's absolutely precise and accurate in any lab you go in. Right. Right. And so but the wine industry doesn't want that law changed, although it'd make a lot of sense to change it because precision and measuring is very easy today. Right? But they don't want it changed for two reasons. One, they can downstate the amount of alcohol in the bottle or right. upstate it, whatever their goal is. Mm-hmm. Right. And then number two, they pay federal excise tax based on the amount of alcohol that's in the bottle. Whoa. So, so basically more alcohol is higher tax. Higher, higher tax. So they have a financial incentive to mark it down. To misstate it. Right. And then further, uh, there's no law requiring them to accurately state it. It's a, that's a really bad well, formula. Well, the, there is a law that allows them to inaccurately state it. Yeah, or, or yeah, right. almost. No, I, by the way, all, everything I'm going to tell you here is verifiable. Mm-hmm. With a simple Google search, yeah. this is not like marketing spin, or you know, you can just do a Google search and and stated alcohol on a wine bottle, and it will take you right to the TTB. It's one of the very few things that the federal government, the very very few things that the federal government is involved in in mm. winemaking. Most of all the alcohol regulation in the United States is regulated by the states. Yes, state level. Yeah. But labeling is one of the aspects that the federal government is involved in. So the TTB approves all the labels in, mm-hmm. in the United States for wine, whether it's imported or exported or grown here. Wow. Uh, so, well, okay, so that's startling. <laughs> and uh, so basically when I'm buying a wine that's labeled at least in the United States, um, I can't trust that the amount of alcohol that states well, is accurate. No, you can't. But furthermore, most, most consumers probably just don't even pay any attention in yeah. the first place. Unless they have heard, I'm probably the only person in the wine industry talking about this. Mm -hmm. And so unless they've heard me speak about or or read about something that we've published or have been published in, people are not thinking about alcohol. They're not even thinking about wine. They just think that wine is a natural product. Right. They think that wine is the healthiest thing for them to drink, and particularly red wine. And Mm -hmm. as you mentioned red wine earlier, most people who have problems with wine, Mm -hmm. or in terms of the way they feel, that comes from red wine. Right. Right, and particularly for women, mm-hmm. and there's Correct. a whole bunch of reasons for that. The the two primary reasons are higher alcohol, mm-hmm. and then biogenetic amines. The two primary offenders are uh, tyramine and histamine, mm-hmm. which, in the way commercial wines are made, exaggerates these biogenetic amines, and women are particularly sensitive to them. Yeah, it, it seems like what they're getting is a histamine response, right? You know, uh, when right. they describe their symptoms, which you won't have that from a natural wine. Because yeah. the way it's made. Mm-hmm. See, what's happening, it's not only the alcohol. It's not only the additives, which we'll talk about in a moment. Mm-hmm. It's not only the technical manipulations that's happening to wine, but it's the extraction. Mm-hmm. So it's a winemaking style that's changed. So let's talk about that. Can Why you- that changed mm-hmm. is Robert Parker. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get there, so we're there now. So right. uh, and <laughs> you described it this well, way. Well, so, he's yeah. a large man. He's a large man. Right. Probably has some sugar. He's blood a type two issues. diabetic. Yeah, uh-huh. right. And um, and so, and incidentally, we, we should say, and I think anybody watching this, but Robert Parker's influence on the wine industry is. Ra- I, I think I read a Wall Street Journal article once that said that out of any industry, he's got more influence on this industry than there's no comparable person to him in another industry that has that radical an influence. Right. He's the m- most impactful wine critic in history. Yeah. Right. And so 30 years ago, 40 years, 30 years ago when this started to change, right? Mm -hmm. I might mention when I was talking about irrigation and all the problems, which we didn't cover all the problems, but irrigation Mm -hmm. didn't come to to California grape growing Mm -hmm. until 1973. Prior to that, everything in California was also dry farmed. And by the way, as a result, alcohol levels in wines in the 60s and 70s were 12, 12 and a half percent, mm-hmm. just like they are for the wines that we sell and drink. Mm-hmm. This exaggerated winemaking style didn't become a thing until Robert Parker made it a thing. And I, I, I won't mention the vineyard, but I sat next to the owner of a winery, fairly large, well-known winery in Napa, and I asked him flat out, I said, do you build your wines for Robert Parker's palate? And he said, absolutely. For sure. For sure. So Robert Parker comes to the Napa Valley a couple of times a year. It's a big brouhaha mm-hmm. to get his attention and his blessing. And the fact of the matter is, if he gives you a high score, mm-hmm. meaning 90 points or above, and it's worth mentioning that he invented, he's very clever, mm-hmm. and he was trying to help people, I'm sure, legitimately. 
I mean, he believed what he was doing was helping people, yep. I'm sure. Yeah. And so um, I don't know that he's a bad actor. No. And it's, I think he's trying to help people decide which wines were better. And he had a palate that people started to trust because he invented mm-hmm. the 100 point scale. Mm. So he invented. I didn't know that. That was his creation. Yeah, he created the 100 point rating system. How'd they rate wines right. prior to that? There were no ratings. Wow. Right. And wow. so you would just walk into a bottle shop and you would take the advice of, of your, you know, of the bottle shop owner, you would go into a store. Now you go into the store and they got neck hangers on them that say, you know, 90 point rating. Now RP. that 90 point rating could come from, he invented it, but right. then others have others duplicated using it. it. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's kind of like Michelin to restaurants then, right? right? I mean, right. so suddenly now you got a rating, it's, it's become a branded rating that people know and can trust. And, uh, and actually probably, like you said, I don't know he's a bad actor. I think that's probably a big contribution. Trust if you yeah. like his palate. Yes. Right, so his palate is very extracted, mm-hmm. right? Big, big wines, mm-hmm. um, and so that are picked later, right. higher sugar, right? This just creates this big alcohol. So, talk about what extraction means, though. When you say these wines are very extracted, what is extracted that mean? means, in, in addition to extracting, you also got a lot of new oak, mm-hmm. which we believe is a problem. We can talk about that in a minute. But extractions are when red wines macerate. Mm-hmm which is how red wine gets its color. Mm-hmm. It's how it gets its increase in polyphenols. Mm-hmm. So white wine has just over 200 polyphenols because it's made with just free-run juice. Mm-hmm. Red wine has over 800 polyphenols, flavonoids, and antioxidants, and those come from right. contact with the skin and the seeds. Mm-hmm. It's also where red wine gets its tannin structure. Mm-hmm. Right. But where the extraction comes in and the problem comes in is that the contact with the skins is extended. So it's, to, more, so it's more extracted if the, you extend the contact with the skin. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And one of the primary benefits of that from a marketing point of view is you get darker red wine. Right. So the longer that the skin contact is with the juice, the darker the red wine will be. Mm-hmm. Ameri- it'll also have more body. Mm-hmm. It'll also have more uh, mouthfeel. Right. And then with the higher sugars and glycerol, mm-hmm. which is a sugar byproduct, that's where you get these long finishes, mm-hmm. right? You don't have that with natural wine because right. it's not it's not made in that style. Mm-hmm. It's made in an old world style, like that people made in their backyards, right? right? And so, but the extraction, Americans believe that the darker a red wine is, the higher its quality. Mm-hmm. There's just no truth to that. Right. It is true that some grapes create darker wines. It is true that that some winemaking style creates darker wines that also have more body and other characteristics you might like. Mm-hmm. But the color of the wine or the depth of wine has nothing to do with its quality. Mm-hmm. Same thing for lipidity. Mm-hmm. So Americans believe that a clear wine mm-hmm. is a better wine, that there's something faulted in a wine that doesn't have perfect lipidity or right. clarity. Right. Right. There's no truth to that either. In mm-hmm. fact, I would tell you just the opposite, mm-hmm. that an unfiltered wine right, has texture Mm-hmm. and body and life yes right because sort of like i compare it to like drinking a french press coffee mm-hmm. right so when you make a french press coffee versus a drip coffee which has been filtered right right you have a lot of clarity and lipidity in the in the filtered coffee but what you're missing that you get in that french press is that granular texture yeah. that's in the coffee right and, and more so, flavors. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got more complexity to it. Yeah, and it, that's a great analogy because one uses a filter, one doesn't. So that, that, that right there, I think, for people who understand coffee, can translate that to wine sure. immediately. Great. So, so basically the extraction is saying, hey, we're, we're leaving the contact with the skins further. This is going to be thicker, more lush, uh, you know, Bigger, more tannic, you know, more... Picked it, finish. higher sugars, yeah. higher alcohol. See, alcohol, mm-hmm. as I mentioned, we see alcohol as... We see alcohol as a problem in wine, right. not as a benefit. We right. think alcohol is dangerous. Right? Well, there's got to be a sweet spot, right? There's like an area that needs to be, but it starts to get to a place where it's out of balance. Yeah, but here's here's the thing with alcohol is that it adds a lot of density to wine. Mm-hmm. So when people drink natural wines at lower alcohol, they're like, oh, these are light, mm-hmm. right? Because alcohol adds a lot of density. Mm-hmm. And that density translates into boldness. Right. Right. And so this, it's also alcohol is very helpful for, you know, we sell to a health focused consumer. Mm -hmm. So 
We sell to people who care about what they put in their body. We ca- we sell wines and drink wines with people who want to know what's in the bottle. Right. Who would, if they were able to, would read a contents label. Right. You see, there's 76 additives approved by the FDA for the use in winemaking in the United States. Seven, so beyond what we've been talking about, uh, or maybe 76. some 76 additives. Right. All you have to do is search and they, wine. Do they have to be labeled or no? No, this is the whole problem. This is the other. This is the major collusion between the wine industry and uh, the government. Mm-hmm. And so, n- nothing has to be labeled. Right? I mean, I could add seventy six things into my wine, and, and you have... would never know it as a consumer. You have no idea what's in it. So you wake up at and three o'clock in the morning with a headache. This is, yeah. this is when you talk about mm-hmm. feeling bad from drinking wine. Mm-hmm. It's it's from two things. Well, three things. It's from higher alcohol. So alcohol has been rising steadily in mm-hmm. wines mm-hmm. all over the world, but particularly in the U.S., which is averaging now nearly 15%. Average? Wow. Average. And, and that's what's stated. Mm-hmm. We don't know what's real, mm-hmm. right? That's the stated amount. Mm-hmm. It's been climbing steadily over the last 30 years for a few reasons. Alcohol is addictive. Mm-hmm. And alcohol is also a domino drug, what I call a domino drug. What I mean by that is that the more you drink, the more likely you are to drink more. Right. So you get kind of pulled into it. So the higher the alcohol, the more likely you are to drink more, Mm -hmm. and consequently they sell more wine. So the wine industry actually likes alcohol. Yeah. And many consumers like it as well Mm -hmm. uh, because their palate has been deadened from the overexposure to processed foods Mm -hmm. and the overexposure to sugar. And so their palate has been deadened a bit. And so mm. this higher alcohol translates differently to them, right? Versus if you're not eating much sugar and you're eating less processed and a more whole food diet, mm-hmm. right? Then your palate is more alive. Right. And you don't want that density necessarily. Right. And then the other thing is that alcohol is not friendly with food. So mm. when we talk about food wine pairings, mm-hmm. I mean, which is why white wines oftentimes pair better with foods actually than red because the red has so much boldness to it mm-hmm. that the foods get overpowered by this new 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 world winemaking style. Right. Right. So yeah, you can pair it with elk, but if you wanted to pair a red wine with a fish, mm-hmm. you know, we have wines that we call fish reds. Right. Right. Because they're so light and delicate that you could drink it with an oyster or eat it with a light white fish and right. and it would pair beautifully. Mm. Right. But but you're not going to find these big new world wines are going to be friendly with fish, right? In that way, like right. for red wines. But so the alcohol, so alcohol has been rising steadily. But then the other thing is causing us to feel bad are the winemaking styles, mm-hmm. the extractions, mm-hmm. and also the exposure to oak products, mm-hmm. which may impart methanol, which is actually twice as toxic as ethanol. So right. when, you, when you talk about oak, you're talking about the, the, the barrel fermentation that yes. you're doing? Yes, well, yeah. the, it could get in there any number of different ways. It mm-hmm. could be chips, dust, pellets. But for finer wines, it's going to be new oak barrels, mm-hmm. right? So Which is it, traditional. It's traditional, except mm-hmm. it's only, it's only, it's, new oak is only used in certain parts of the world because it's super expensive. Right. So it's been used in Bordeaux for a long time mm-hmm. where you have cult wines. But when you go to the natural wine world or you go to old wine world, they don't use new oak products. Mm-hmm. All those products are, all, all the barrels are, are neutral. You know, so a wine, Meaning they've been used for They've time been used for six or seven vintages. Right. They become neutral. Right. So they no longer impart what we believe are some of the unhealthy aspects of new oak. Okay. They also don't impart any flavor. It's interesting because, you know, in some of my winery visits uh, in, in New World places, you know, they talk about new oak and how they have the barrel turnover to keep, you know, to keep that oakiness in their wine. It's a winemaking style. Yeah. But those wines make me feel bad. Yeah. So in the third element of these 76 additives, now, not all 76 are poisonous, Mm -hmm. but four of them are pretty toxic. Mm -hmm. The problem is you don't know what's in your wine, right? And the wine industry spent millions of dollars in lobby money to keep contents labeling off of wine. This has been, this is not an accident. Mm -hmm. The Wine Institute and the wine industry, Wine Institute is a lobbying arm for the American wine industry, has spent millions of dollars in lobby money to keep contents labeling off of wine. Wow. Right? Is there any parallel? To, I, I can't think of any other consumer-consumed thing that, that's, that you can do that. It's the, it's the 
only major food product mm -hmm. without a contents label. And again, right. this isn't an accident. There have mm -hmm. been any number of lobbying efforts to get transparency and labeling not only on content, uh, not only on ingredients and contents, but also in nutritional labeling. Through independent lab testing, though, you could figure out what's in there, I'd imagine, in most ones. Well, right? yes, yes and no. Oh. Uh, so it's, it's cost prohibitive to test for all of these things. Right. Right? Because the tests are very specific. Like, it's easy to test for sugar. It's easy mm -hmm. to test for alcohol. Sure. It's easy to test for sulfur. Mm -hmm. It's easy to test for mold. Mm -hmm. Like, in the United States, as an example, uh, there's no requirement to test your wine for mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. The primary offender and most poisonous one is okra toxin A, mm -hmm. right? This is sort of what made Dave Asprey famous you know, and with coffee. Right. And so well, the same problem exists with wine. In the EU, mm -hmm. it is a requirement that every wine be tested for mycotoxins. Mm. In the United States, no wine is tested for mycotoxins. Wow. The only time a U.S. wine gets tested for mycotoxins is if it gets exported to another country, mm. right? And so these are so these are some things. But when we go to test for glyphosate, we just tested twenty California wines. Mm -hmm. About eighty percent of them came back positive for glyphosate, mm. right? There've been any. We didn't publish this. We're not. We're not whistleblowers on yeah. on these wineries. We did it as an experiment because there's been two other studies that you're probably familiar with showing glyphosate is common in California wines. Yeah, well, and, and we've done a whole docu series on uh, GMOs and glyphosate, so yeah, we're you know painfully familiar with that circumstance. And this maybe ties back because you might have somebody who says, "Well, we're an organic grower, but if they're irrigating with water, you can still get glyphosate." you know, into the end product, even though they're growing organically? Yeah, so it's speculated. So both organic and non-organic vineyards, not in our test. Mm -hmm. We only tested one organic vineyard in this test we just did. And that organic vineyard came back negative on glyphosate. Mm -hmm. That organic vineyard also happens to be dry farmed, mm -hmm. right? Now, I'm not making the parallel between, they don't know if glyphosate is getting in the in the fruit from irrigation, but yeah. it's speculated yes. that it's coming from irrigation. Mm -hmm. Ninety nine point nine percent of U.S. vineyards are irrigated. Yeah, right. And so it's speculated it's coming. And here's why: when glyphosate is applied in a vineyard, it's not applied the same way that it is for say wheat. Right. So with wheat application, glyphosate is is applied from the air, either from a crop duster or a drone. Mm -hmm. And so that overspray into a neighboring organic farm which has been a problem in wheat farming as well, right. where organic farms are testing positive for glyphosate, mm -hmm. but that's coming from overspray. Mm -hmm. Well, the way a vineyard is applied, it's very close to the ground, mm -hmm. either by a machine or by hand. It's very close to the ground. Mm -hmm. There's really not this opportunity for this kind of classic overspray. Mm -hmm. Also, organic vineyards have a minimum requirement of distance to a neighboring vineyard mm -hmm. right and so it's not just your normal tractor tractor run it's another like three rows right right that they have to be away from uh, the the, the non vineyard yeah. mm -hmm. and so the the it's not it's not likely that it's coming from overspray it's more likely coming from the irrigation yeah and, and that's so, what i'm saying and that's why the dry farm would protect from that but if you're irrigating it gets into the water table and then we should uh, it's interesting I, I think we should do a another test only of organic vineyards but testing some some uh, irrigated ones as well because the only one that we tested was dry farm was dry farm yeah and that, I think that would be a really interesting test to look at uh, just you know to get that particular perspective and we're talking about U.S. but um, similar problems in other New World wines yeah uh, so I mean this is not Australia, in U.S. this is not Zealand, in U.S. Yeah. in the EU there are fifty six additives mm -hmm. right and so it, it, this is not a U.S. problem the U.S. just sort of leads the world in the exploration of greed. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of an American idea. Yeah. Right? In the way we do it at scale. Yeah. The way, you know, greed is not a new idea. Greed's not an American idea. Mm -hmm. But the way Americans greed at scale, mm -hmm. right? Scale is very much an American idea. Yeah. Right? Americans invented the concept of large scale right. on everything. Right. Right? It's not like, you know, when, think of like a car company like Fiat, right, mm -hmm. in Italy. It was always just kind of like an Italian car company. Right. That had some sales, you know, in the U.S. or some sales in other countries, but it was basically like 
an Italian car company right. for most of its history, right? But Ford, on the other hand, you know, is a global brand at scale, right? Right, and so it's just Americans just do things in a, you know, kind of bare way. So, with these additives now that you're saying there, they're not labeled. Um, are you finding that when you take somebody who says, I can't drink wine, or I have this horrible response to wine, or I can't drink red wine, what we described earlier, and I can tell you, even you know, even recently, uh, I, I was out on a really nice wine dinner with my wife, and sure enough, three o'clock in the morning, I'm waking up, and I'm feeling like really bad, and a pounding headache, and I'm like, what the heck is this? And I know it was the wine, and and it's like, you know, I, I'm realizing, okay, this happened to me. A lot of other people are saying similar things. What is, uh, are you finding that you can literally take that same person who has that sensitivity, give them, uh, you know, a wine that has met your criteria at dry farms, and they could drink it with thousands and thousands, thousands of not, not even hundreds, thousands, thousands of <laughs> testimonials. Okay. Uh, and, or, or, you know, it, it's, we sponsor about 140 events around the world. Mm. I'm leaving tonight to London to a health biohacking summit there mm. where we're sponsoring the wine. But we sponsor most all the health and performance events, forward-looking health, not right. traditional medicine, but right. forward-looking health sure. events in the U.S. Uh, as a result, we come in contact with tens of thousands of people where we pour them wine mm -hmm. or and particularly women will come up and they'll say, I, you know, I, I love red wine. I can't drink it. Right. Right. And we say, don't fear. <laughs> drink this. You'll yeah. feel great. Right. I guarantee you, you know, when we talk them into drinking, they come back the next morning. They're just like, oh, my gosh. I, you know, thank you. I've been able to return to drinking red wine again. Yeah. And so. Which is a big miss, incidentally. I mean, from a lifestyle standpoint, you know, not feeling like I can't do that anymore. Uh, is it's a big, like you're losing a lot of joy in your life. Yeah, when you're waking up at 3 a.m., it's a combination of both the unknown, but it's mm -hmm. also higher alcohol. Yep. So alcohol dehydrates you, Yep. right? And this, you get up, got to get some water, mm -hmm. right? The problem with waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning for most of us is that then we can't go back to yeah, sleep because now we think all about all the things we need to be doing tomorrow. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, or the things that are broken that somehow we're going to fix right. there in the bed. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, so waking up is like a disaster zone. Yeah, in, in, most, interrupting sleep is right. a bad thing no matter right. what's doing it. So, you know, it's higher alcohol plus all these additives and, you know, and, and extractions. And all, we don't know really what causes it. We right. don't know what the cofactors are. There's no research to support this. Mm -hmm. There's nobody to fund it. Right. Here's what we do know. When you drink lower alcohol, natural wine, you don't have that reaction. Mm -hmm. Right. And there, I can't tell you all of the cofactors are exactly what. I can tell you for sure that higher alcohol is contributing to your hangover and to dehydration. Well, That's for certain. And, and I can tell you that we just got back, uh, you know, for this docuseries that we spent uh, some weeks in Italy with a film crew going to, you know, multiple vineyards that are, you know, the natural vineyards. They are dry farmed, that they're family owned, et cetera. All the things you're describing. And of course, while you're there, you know, you're, you're not only with dinner. You're drinking have, with the winemakers. Lunch, you're drinking sure. with the winemakers. Dinner, you're drinking with the winemakers. Get, and I was getting less of my normal amount of sleep. I was waking up fresh the next morning. I had sure. no issue whatsoever. Not one day the entire time I was in Italy and I probably consumed four times the amount of wine I normally would if sure. I were home. Sure. So, there, so I know there's something there. And, and, uh, and the things that you're saying are starting to put the pieces in place saying, okay, this is adding up to something. Yeah, so it's, you know, there are also technical manipulations. Again, irrigation leads to a number of problems. Mm -hmm. So, again, this higher alcohol is from, from higher sugar. Sometimes alcohol has to be removed from the wine because it's actually too high. Wow. Another reason that I mentioned when they use these lab-grown yeast is that another problem with, with, with native yeast, wild yeast, is that they won't survive a high alcohol environment. Mm -hmm. And so if the high alcohol levels get too high, it will kill the yeast. Mm -hmm. The commercial yeast have been modified to withstand a high alcohol environment. Right. So you might commonly have an 18 or plus percent wine, and then they use a technical process to separate the alcohol in the water and actually pull alcohol out, right. making it because the alcohol gets too hot. Then it, I mean, the, the wine tastes too hot. Yeah, and, and it gets a, back to the fundamentals of what you're describing. And if you are a uh, an industry trying to do something at scale, you're an industrial concern. Then of course you want that that yeast that can hold up and that can give you more you know uh, latitude towards how you can scale up your production. It's just more stable. Yeah, 
It's easier. It's just like it's just like irrigation. Mm. It's easier to farm an irrigated grapevine. Right. It's not healthy for the earth. It's not healthy for the vine, and it's not good for you. But it's easier for the farmer to irrigate, and particularly at scale, it's easier to farm an irrigated grapevine. An unirrigated grapevine requires quite a bit more work, and right. particularly soil management. Mm-hmm. And so much of the soil all over the world, but certainly much of U.S. vineyard soil, is dead. Mm. I mean, when you drive by it and you look under it, it looks like a moonscape. Right. When you're in a natural vineyard, it looks very wild. There are things growing under the mm-hmm. vine. It's not overly tended. It's not overly plowed. Yeah. I mean, there are many natural wine growers that never plow the earth. Right. Right. They, as this Italian described to me who doesn't speak very good English, he's like, we let the tiny animals do the plowing. He's talking about insects. <laughs> right, right, right. He's right. like, we let the tiny animals. And another reason that they don't want to turn that soil is because when you turn that that topsoil over, you expose all of those organisms, millions of organisms that are beneath the beneath the surface of the soil. Mm-hmm. You expose them to the sun and you kill them. Yeah. Right. So leaving those intact uh, really provides for a healthier soil. Right. So when you, as you know, I don't need to tell you this, having been to Italy or small family farms. It's not like coming to Napa where the, the, the main attraction is the tasting room. Right. Right. And so it's not theater. The theater is in the vineyard. Right. So the moment you go to a natural wine grower, all he wants to do is take you to the vineyard and talk about the soil and the rock and the composition of the living soil. That Their obsession is around soil, soil, and more soil. Right. Right. And so there's no tasting room. If you taste, it's going to be in the cellar or probably over their kitchen table, or maybe a, te- a table that's propped up in the cellar, right? But there's no concept of a tasting room per se. Well, their obsession is in, with, the, with the soil. Yeah. To totally validate that point, one of my favorite places we visited in Italy, a small farm, completely dry farmed and organic, um, the winemaker, who was a young guy, and his, he said, uh, he goes, we're young, but we speak like we're old because you know, they're about the old ways. And not only did he walk me into the vineyards, but he walked me through the entire place and talked about it being a habitat that they have animals there that are raised a certain way. You know, the chickens, the donkeys, the cows, and, and, and that th- this, all this works together. It's not just, there's just vines. There's an entire habitat here that comes together, that is holistic in nature, that creates this entire thing. And inside, I'm kind of smiling because uh, I didn't put those two things together, but you're exactly right. They didn't say, hey, come to our tasting room and look at our displays. They said, let me walk you through this habitat. And then we landed in a place that we could open up some. And these wines, beautiful, spectacular, you know, just like otherworldly. But understanding why they're that way, as compared to saying I got hit, I got hit with a sledgehammer with a bunch of fruit, I got something that was just the spirit of everything that was going on in that place came out, you know, in, in a glass and, and uh, came into my body. So, you know, you're, what you're describing um, is, I believe, um, a culture war between uh, scale industrial wine and distribution versus individual farmers who are winemakers who have a philosophy about quality and life as compared to scale and profit. doesn't mean they don't want to make a profit. just means that they make a profit doing things a certain way. Well, they make less profit. Yeah, and they certainly make less profit. But, you know, the design of nature, mm-hmm. the logic of nature is symbiotic. Yeah. And so when we have biodiversity and when we have nature acting in its own interest, yeah. it, I mean, this has been working for a billion years, right? <laughs> so it's like this, it's when we try to interrupt mm-hmm. and in grape farming, irrigation is the first intervention into to nature's logic. Right. Right. And so when we, man, tries to intervene on nature's logic, Mm-hmm. which is perfect and symbiotic and connected to all source energy. Right. Right. And connected to the spirit. So when, when the farmer, when you meet with a small family farmer, when you meet with a farmer who is obsessed with biodiversity and obsessed with feeding the symbiotic success that nature enjoys. Right. Nature's ugly. It's competitive. Yeah. You know, not everything works elegantly to 
some survive, some do not. Right. It's 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 a brutal place. Yeah. But it has been logically designed over time mm -hmm. to work perfectly and symbi symbiotically. So when you you know the, when you mention the word spirit, when mm -hmm. I meet with small natural wine growers, they all talk about spirit. Yeah. The spirit of the earth, the spirit of the connectedness yeah. of nature, the spirit of their connection to the plant, right? It's all about the plant. It's all about the soil. It's all about farming. It's not about winemaking. Nobody right. talks about winemaking. That's right. Because there's nothing to make. Right. You've got wild native yeast and fruit with sugar in it. Right. You can make wine. Yep. Right? And their, I mean, their attitude is, I just need to get out of the way of it. Exactly. Exactly. Just get out of the way of it produce a beautiful fruit right. and get out of the way of right. it, right? And so, as you know, if you if you just pick a ripe bunch of a uh, cluster of berries right. and you throw it into a bucket with enough force that the skin breaks open, uh -huh. you will begin fermentation as long as it's warm enough. Right, right. right. right? As, long as, as, as long as the temperature is warm enough, the yeast will activate and start to eat the sugar right, right. there in the bucket. And you right. won't, probably won't have a high quality wine product, <laughs> but you'll have a fermentation that will spontaneous. In fact, in the Napa Valley or in any vineyard region in the world, in the fall, mm -hmm. post-harvest, if you go in October, like to Napa, the entire for about a month, the entire valley floor smells like fermenting wine. Right. Because what's happened is the fruit that wasn't selected or fell off the vine during the uh, for, during the harvest then actually starts to ferment on the valley floor. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you can. It's a very distinct. It smells like going into a cellar. Right. Everywhere you go, all across it for about three weeks. And so that's actually natural fermentation. Right. What the commercial wine growers are doing is that they're introducing sulfur dioxide. There are three times sulfur dioxide gets added to commercial wines. Mm -hmm. The first time is when they kill the, the native yeast using sulfur mm -hmm. because they don't want the native yeast and the lab-grown yeast competing with each other. Right. And so they use sulfur dioxide to kill the native yeast, and then they inoculate it with this modified commercial yeast. Mm -hmm. The second time sulfur dioxide is used is to break the fermentation mm -hmm. before it completes just at the end, leaving residual sugar behind in the wine. Mm -hmm. Right? That's how sugar sugar is not added to wine. Right. Sugar gets in wine from the winemaker breaking the fermentation with sulfur dioxide. Mm -hmm. So that the yeast is killed then, mm -hmm. leaving residual sugar behind. Sugar adds mouthfeel and okay. finish and uh, glycerol to wine. And then the third time is, of course, at bottling when it gets a massive jolt of sterilization. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the, so there are three times that sulfur will be used in commercial winemaking. So what's interesting is you've completely gone the other way. Basically, you know, all industrial wine is moving toward, you know, this sort of, you know, uh, winemaking practice and this sort of instant gratification, big, bold, you know, type of experiences. And you've said, hey, this is wrong. And I want to start looking for these dry farmed wines that are natural, old practices, don't have all these additives, et cetera. And there was a consumer marketplace, and this is what I think was genius about what you've done. The, most consumers who consume wine have no clue about any of this, and they're not going to sit and really take the time to do it. But you recognize something. Um, a lot of people who are very much into their health, and there's a big community of that. If you look at the wellness industry, a trillion dollar industry, a lot of those people like wine and they're going to care about this. And you went out and said, I'm going to, I'm going to source wine for them. Well, I was sourcing wine for me. So in the very beginning, mm -hmm. all of this process, which took place over a, a nearly year period, mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out how to drink better. I didn't think of it as a business. Right. I didn't start this as a business. And even today, my focus in the work that I do in terms of the public speaking or in terms of the work I do is really not on promoting dry farm wines. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've not heard me promote my company. I'm not here right. promoting dry farm wines. I'm promoting education. Right. And so you can make the decision that's right for you and your body mm -hmm. or you and your family, right? I'm going to give you the arsenal of information, the education to make it. See, these secrets, mm -hmm. what we call the dirty, dark secrets of the wine industry, you deserve to know about those. Right. Now, if you choose to drink that product, and then great. 
then enjoy. Right. But you should have the information and the knowledge to make an educated choice. And by the way, natural wines are not expensive. Right. Right. So natural wines average about $25 a bottle, mm-hmm. which for a handcrafted fine wine product is actually quite affordable. Yes. I know it might sound expensive to some people, but for wine aficionados, and our goal was to help regular wine drinkers. Right. Right. So we're, you know, I w- I'm a regular wine drinker. I was suffering from being a regular wine drinker, mm-hmm. and I wanted to help other regular wine drinkers, which is why we're a wine club. Right. We don't sell one-off bottles or you come in and buy this bottle or that bottle. Right. We have a curated selection that is meant to satisfy the needs of regular wine drinkers because mm-hmm. they're the ones I can help the most, right? Even with lowering their alcohol. Right. I mean, I've had some tenuous relationship with alcohol over the course of my life. Mm-hmm. Had I known about lower alcohol, healthier wine sooner, I think my my life would have been enhanced by that. Right. Right. So to be able to educate people, and here's what happens very often. I mean, that very often they, at first, they'll say, these wines are kind of light. You know, uh, they, I, you know I, I miss my big, bold, you know, cab. You know, case in point, I mean, you know, it's been some years now, the first time I saw you at a health convention, because that's, you know, my world and my background. And I drank the wine and said, it was like, hmm, very pleasant, a little light, you know, right. kind of, but exactly what you said, that was my, that was my first experience. So that's, every, because, you know, everybody has the same wine experiences. Everybody's been drinking the same commercial wines. Right. Right. Which are all big, bold, right. this kind of flavor profile that was, you know, developed by the primarily by following Robert Parker's rating right. system, right. right? Which sold wine. And mm-hmm. if you're if you're a vintner, then your goal as the vintner and the winemaker is to sell wine. Right. As for as high a price as you can. If right. you can get these high ratings, you can not only sell wine. Selling wine's not easy. Right. Right. And so it's about dragging these boxes around into restaurants and retailers hoping to sell a two to five case drop. Right. right. <laughs> I mean uh, or if you're a mass producer, you're in, you know, you're in big chains. Mm-hmm. But if you're just a, so is, selling wine is, is difficult. These ratings are super, super helpful. Right. Right. And so, but all of those wines have this big, bold juiciness, you know, and also higher alcohol. Yeah. Remember, alcohol adds a lot of density to wine. Yeah. So when you move the alcohol back, because there are basically two things in wine, water mm-hmm. and ethyl alcohol. Right. Now there's some polyphenols and other flavor components in it, but the t- two major the two major components of wine are water. Water is the most most significant component. Sure. And then ethyl alcohol. Mm-hmm. Well, it stands to reason that when you start removing the alcohol, you end up having more water. Right. So you end up with a lighter, fresher product. Mm-hmm. It's also more friendly with food and also causes you to feel much better. Right, right. So we've visited many parts of the world talking about wine in different cultures. Israel, even around Europe. I've traveled, you know, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. I mean, you know, everywhere you go, wine's a thing. And even, especially even in ancient cultures. And uh, you look and say, geez, how has this been something that's been a big part of the human experience for eons of time? And, you know, right up until today, you know, there's something about wine that is special. It's not that, you know, it's not alcohol like other types of, you know, uh, you know, whiskeys and whatever, not putting any of those down, uh, just saying that their wine seems to have a different uh, characterization, a different culture and a different bond with with human beings and the human spirit, um, which is why people want to pursue it and then are frustrated when they don't respond well to it. So what is it about wine? I mean, do you have any context? Is there a spiritual aspect of this that that has that that you've observed that that is that you've had some epiphanies around? Listen, wine has been consumed by humans for about 9,000 years. It has had a tremendous impact on religion, mm-hmm. on culture, on art, on communities, on health, on socialization, mm-hmm. right? And so wine is just a very magical elixir. Mm-hmm. Wine is also, the other thing that makes wine super unique of all the let's call it commercially available because we could go Mm -hmm. down a rabbit hole of alcohol products Mm -hmm. like a mead or whatever. But for the commercially available alcohol choices, wine and particularly natural wine is the only one where the spirit of the farm 
and the spirit of the farmer mm. and the spirit of the wine grower and the spirit of the wine maker in fermentation are all the same person mm. and all the same family. And you don't have, that's not true for spirits. That's not true for, for beer, mm-hmm. right? Th- those are, it's true only for the grape. And so the spirit, you can taste the spirit of that farm if you're working with a natural, whole, clean, biodiverse, you know, uh, nature, natured logic uh, farming concern, you, you will taste that. The terroir, as mm-hmm. the French would call it, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, the wine tastes like the place right. and the spirit from where it's from. Mm-hmm. But I want to talk more about what happens with wine, mm-hmm. right? And why I believe that it's so important and why it's been so important across all aspects of the human experience mm-hmm. is because wine... You know, in this, it's different than spirits in that the alcohol is still significantly lower. And historically, when we look over time, mm-hmm. over centuries, right, or thousands of years, all wines were in this alcohol range that I'm talking about. Right. All wines were 11 or 12 percent, 10 percent. That was just how natural wines were made before mm-hmm. they became this extracted kind of winemaking style. And so for most of history, we're talking about natural wine. Mm-hmm. We're talking about lower alcohol. And so what happens at wine, I don't drink during the daytime. Mm-hmm. And for health reasons and performance reasons, I don't recommend other people do either. Mm-hmm. But around the dinner table, mm-hmm. there's something that's very magical that happens with wine. And the most magical thing is that wine creates love, mm-hmm. right? And as humans, intrinsically, we just want to love and be loved. Mm-hmm. And wine promotes love. I've had dinner with you. Yes. And we've talked about love. Yeah. And I think, you know, as the planet survives, tries to survive, as a species tries to survive, a a rise in consciousness, a rise in the expression of love Mm. will be a key component to our survival as a species. Just higher consciousness and sharing love and Mm. telling people that, that, and wine just makes that a little easier. So what wine does is it lowers that window of vulnerability down. Right, and it allows us to see others mm-hmm. and to be seen. Yes. And once we can see and be seen, then we can have a translation that's really at a very core human level about sharing love and affection. Mm-hmm. Right. And which is why you know, hug is my handshake. Yeah. You know, because we we know that that human connection. Is healthy, yeah. And we know that in societies where wine is consumed, in the blue zones, five of them, mm-hmm. wine is a daily staple of life, right? And these are natural wines, right? right? Typically made in the garage or the backyard <laughs> of these folks who are living in these remote areas, particularly in the Mediterranean. And so, and we we don't know about successful aging in totality, but we do believe, and science shows that socialization and community is such a vital aspect of a successful long life, right? And so wine really promotes this sense of community and promotes the sense of loving spirit. And anytime we can bring more love into our life, I think that's just about the most beneficial thing that can happen to us. And wine promotes that community and that love. Yeah, I think I think you've uh, hit it on the head as far as uh, putting words to what people can feel, but maybe uh, have never been able to properly express because there is a warmth you feel uh, with so wine. Warm, there's a there's a connection and a bond. Yeah, you feel a bond. You know, you're sharing a beautiful bottle of wine with someone. It, it it's not just a matter. Of, hey, I'm drinking some alcohol, but there is something special. There's there, something no magical and yeah. spiritual in that yeah. bottle, yeah. the living bottle, Yes, the natural wine, not sterilized, but right. there's something alive and real. There's a spirit there that when you open the bottle and it evolves right. and the wine evolves and you're evolving with it, right? And with lower alcohol, which is going to be most wines, but certainly historically with lower alcohol, we're keeping a cognitive connection. Yes. We're actually generating an enhanced creative expression. And I remember one of the most meaningful wine dinners of my life was with you Mm -hmm. and Jeff. Yes. And and some other friends where, man, we just got deep. Yeah. (laughs) We just got deep. It just got philosophical. And and, and, exactly. And and what was interesting about that dinner, and I I remember because my my wife was there with us and and I had, we had this conversation on the ride home. It's like, I met you multiple times 
always liked you. But man, sitting down and sharing a bottle or a couple of bottles of wine with you, it, it brought us to a place that we never went before. I had the same conversation <laughs> with my business partner about y'all. You know, I was yeah. just like, I was just like, I didn't really know these guys. I mean, I knew them, but I didn't know they were, I didn't know what was inside. Yeah. And this whole night was just like this revelation of, wow, these people are deep. Yeah. And it was so philosophical. This is what the Greeks, you know, the Greeks were talking about lower alcohol and the importance of, of that, and the importance of keeping that cognitive connection and that creative expression. The Greeks used to mix water with their wine yeah. so that they could actually have these conversations and these uh, galas last longer yes. and run deeper by actually lowering the alcohol in their wine by simply adding water. So... Yeah, but as long as we keep that connection, right? And it yeah. was just uh, it was a magical night. I, 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 used, I used to uh, make that kind of jokingly, I'd say, because I've, I've studied and taught philosophy for over 30 years. And, and I used to say, hey, all the great philosophers drank wine. And for you sure. know, I can't break the tradition. I'm going to, you know, I have to keep going. <laughs> so, and, but that does come out. And I think one of the things you said, too, is that it, it creates a zone of safety because you can become more vulnerable. You can share more of what's inside as compared to feeling like, hey, you know, I've got, I got boundaries. Vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. Seeing, allowing people to see us. Yeah. This, it's, it's the magic. Yeah. Right. Vulnerability allows us to be seen, and 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 other people want to see us. Yeah. Right. And we spend most of the beginning of our life in fear of being seen, particularly for men. So men are wearing that mask of yeah. masculinity yeah. That when they were about two years old, <laughs> right? Yeah. That bigger, stronger, badder, meaner, right? That was rewarded. Yeah. And so, you know, when we can take off that mask and be seen, and particularly with other males and be seen and be comfortable, wine helps with that a lot, yeah. Yeah. right? As does a lifetime of discovery you know unfortunately youth is wasted on the young right <laughs> so yes. uh you have to get our age before you start to figure all this out but um, no, no, wine okay. helps with figuring it, it out for I sure was, i was gonna say it, it facilitates the process you know there's one other thing you said that I, I just don't want to let go by because one of the joys of experiencing wine is seeing what it's like when it comes out of the bottle seeing what it's like 15 20 minutes later and throughout the meal it changes and you kind of said it because you used the term magical and it really is, and especially now having visited and been on the ground with, the, with these farmers and the passion that they have and, and knowing everything that goes to the point of the process to getting it to a bottle, which is years of time and, and a lot of uh, toil in the fields and you know, being subject to the whims of the weather and all that stuff comes together. But then when you open the bottle, the cork comes out or the, the top comes off, there's this sort of, um, it's like a genie comes out of the bottle, right? And then you let the genie out and you're going to get on the magic carpet ride, you know, for the rest of the evening that the wine is going to carry you through. It's, it's extraordinary, it's particularly as a bottle evolves. Yeah. You know, and uh, as that bottle evolves with other people. Yeah. And particularly people like us who have such a deep relationship to that magic and that spirit that's mm -hmm. in the bottle and how that spirit evolves and warms you as it opens. And, it, and every sip will be different than the last or the next, you know, and it's just like, it's such an evolution of the bottle. And it's just that magic, it's just that spirit, which came really from the farmer. Yeah. That was the beginning of it. And that was the beginning. And, and so it's, a, I think, appropriate to toast that farmer, you know, when you open their wine and, and you know, acknowledge them, you know, and bring them present to uh, the experience you're having. And I'm sure what's going on right now after this conversation, because it, it happened quite frankly in Italy, where uh, over my right shoulder, there's the, there's Jeff, you know, uh, looking at the monitors, you know, uh, monitoring his conversation. And he's thinking to himself, why aren't we drinking? Yeah. So uh, probably a good time for us to uh, <laughs> to conclude. All I can say is that this was a magical conversation. So thank you so much for spending your time and, and sharing your experience and your spirit with us. Peace be with you. And to you too. Thank you. Very powerful information, wouldn't you say? I now have a whole new context and frame of reference to understanding wine and what it means to consume it in my body and what it means to share it with other people, and I hope you do too.
Marco, I'm very excited for you to demystify a lot of things about wine, because sometimes it's kind of awkward. Am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? Do I understand this properly? For me, someone who has enjoyed wine for many, many years and actually collects wine and, and has tasted in a lot of regions of the world, Italy especially was always a mystery to me. I couldn't figure out Italy and I always felt a little awkward and I felt incompetent really. So I'm looking forward to all you're going to teach us about Italian wine. Uh, and I know that you actually, you, you teach sommeliers about Italian wine, right? Because you have a special expertise there. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I go around the country uh, importing, tasting and, and training sommeliers or the restaurant level or even consumers, uh, different regions of Italy and different wines of Italy. What would you say are some of the unique characteristics of Italian wine versus other regions of the world? I think especially with Italy, um, the meaning of Italian wine is that you're drinking a place where the wines come from. Uh, you're drinking uh, not really who made the wine, but you're drinking that particular climate, the particular region, the particular soil. And that makes it uh, very unique and very um, typical of old world wines. So I'm looking forward to posing these questions to you and hearing what your responses are. Let's do it. This interview is with Marco and Amy Stevanoni. And what I have to tell you is that Marco is somebody you're gonna to get to know really, really well because he is our guide throughout Italy, taking us to the varying vineyards, curating which places we should go, who we should be speaking to, etc. I've learned so much from Marco, and I'm excited because I know you will learn a lot from him also. In this particular setting, we are in Veneto Restaurant in Salt Lake City, which is co-owned by Marco and his wife, Amy. And I have to tell you, I've eaten there many times and never been disappointed. It's an extraordinary experience with wine and food, and you're gonna learn a lot here. So check out this interview with Marco and Amy Stevenson. Amy, Marco, very excited to have this conversation with you. I'm yeah. excited to have you here. So Marco, you know, you, graciously uh, were our guide through Italy you know, to explore a bunch of different regions. Uh, but somehow uh, you ended up bringing Italy uh, with Amy to Veneto restaurant here. So what, what is your, I'll start with your background. I want to know yours also around this, but what got you interested in, in uh, wine and, and food? I feel like for an Italian is, uh, is, is very important. You get up in the morning and uh, the first thing you do is uh, you think and you map out your food day. You know where you're going to have uh, for dinner, you know where restaurant you're going to go. And uh, when I came to the United States, uh, it was a little hard for me. Not because there's not good food, but the food uh, in here that I found, it was uh, at a different taste that my palate would recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, texture and flavors were different. And, and so the more time I spent in the U.S., the more I had to figure out to get better and better to just be happy. And then it ended up that uh, uh, me and Amy met um, almost 20 years ago, and uh, we made uh, a home here in Salt Lake City, and, uh, and now we decided to open this restaurant. Was this in your childhood at all, uh, in your family? In my family, um, I have my uncle that is, uh, has always been a chef in Verona, in mm -hmm. Italy, and uh, he's always been um, a big influence. My mom was always a great cook, and so... Um, Sundays and weeks uh, were always about uh, being together around food. So um. I love what you said uh, when you started out. In Italy, we wake up and plan our food day. <laughs> it's like the, before you brush your teeth, you guys wake up and say, "Okay, what's what, what are we eating today?" <laughs> yes. It is a it is a it is a very important uh, thing. So uh, you map out, you really think about. Uh, okay, I have to go to work, but first priority, what I'm gonna eat today. <laughs> I like those priorities. So Amy, how did you get uh, to be in the restaurant business? I think for both of us, it, it wasn't anything we planned mm -hmm. on. Even before we met, I think we both have had the opportunity to travel a lot and um, eat amazing good food and wine. When we met, that was something we had in common, um, had a great time doing it, and uh, ended up eventually hosting more and more dinner parties at home. Mm -hmm. And he's an amazing cook. He taught himself, like he kind of said, just out of pure survival, 
being in the United States. And I think one thing led to another. Um, we would love to spend our weekends, evenings dining out, but you know, never found that that place that, especially for Marco, felt like home. And so it was many years of more than anything, I think, just um, having fun mm -hmm. with the conversation, what if? And um, it eventually just kind of, the opportunity kind of fell into our lap, I think. Um, finding this little intimate space and things just kind of led us to changing, for me especially, changing my path, and um, never in a million years did I think I'd be a restaurateur. Mm -hmm. But um, really, I think what it comes down to for both of us is we are just sharing what we genuinely, personally love and appreciate with many more people. You know, again, it, like I said, it started out in our home. Mm -hmm. um, Veneto has turned into being a place that really is an extension of our home. Um, so purely, I think, accidental and selfish. It was a selfish reason that we opened the restaurant. Coming from, uh, I grew up on the East Coast, you know, all my ancestors Italian. And uh, when I got to this area of the country, uh, you know, we live in Park City, but suburb of Salt Lake, uh, struggled with trying to find uh, satisfying Italian food or even a good Italian deli for that matter. <laughs> so, uh, so suddenly I show up here and it's like, ooh, uh, there's something going on here. What was the intention behind Veneto. Uh, Veneto is a region of Italy. It's a region that you grew up in. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was the theme or what's the idea behind Veneto as the restaurant? I think uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, uh, the coast, the New York coast is definitely has a great influence of Italians because when uh, the immigration started, they all stopped at the first port. Okay. And so New York, New Jersey and the East Coast are very influenced by Italian. And as you come west, there is less and less and less. And so when uh, we, um, we were here and we decided to open this, it was really to um, give an opportunity to, to people and to experience uh, a regional cuisine, a regional type of cuisine that it's from the region of Veneto in the northeast of Italy without compromise. Being able to uh, having customers sit down and we take them to a journey. Um, Amy I come up with a with a sentence that is amazing is the cheapest airfare to Italy without <laughs> having to get on an cheapest airplane. Cheapest round trip fare. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And so it's uh, that was uh, the idea behind. And uh, you go so far as because I you know, I've eaten here many times now, um, and uh, you go so far as to even uh, import like your wheat I think from Italy rather than yeah you know, make you know, having it local to make your pasta. What things do you do uh, that are I guess uh, going beyond or might be extra effort so that you can create the experience the way that you want it? I think um, it's a combination of many, many things. Uh, um, I, in the past, uh, um, I've noticed that um, because uh, of uh, so many uh, people traveling to Italy and coming back and being extremely happy about Italy and the people and the food, I at first I could not understand uh, why was that because even in Italy there are bad restaurants and there are bad people and it's just a country like another one and and um, and I think I figured out that once you are in a foreign country and and you don't know the language and you're paying with a different money um, you have um, an an open-mindedness of things that you're you're able to absorb them mm -hmm. and so here we wanted to do the same thing with service with food putting people into a state of mind that um, you come in and you should not know everything. It feels a little uncomfortable. Right. You know you're somewhere different. different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, we start from um, start to finish. Uh, we make all our product. Uh, we are, I feel like, one of the few restaurants that don't pre-cook anything. So our dining experience is usually a little slower mm -hmm. than the rest because uh, we don't know what we have to prepare for you until you order it. I know that's like that in Italy also, right? Because uh, when, when we were there on, on, that, on the tour, uh, you know, visiting all the wine regions and the wineries, uh, when we were at the restaurants, uh, there was no um, sense that uh, you should be rushing at all. As a matter of fact, it was the opposite. They want you to really slow down, yeah. take um, your time, enjoy it. It's not like, hey, let's try to turn the tables real fast. No, no intention of... Yeah getting people in and out for sure. And I, and especially in America, I think that 
people are surprised maybe mm -hmm. they're they're just used to the constant checking in by the server mm -hmm. and your your check is brought to the table while you're still you're still eating mm -hmm. um, and that to us i mean dining and being able to spend quality time together um, that's important and um, we do everything we can to encourage people to unplug you know, be focused on who is sitting across from you at the table. You also are a, uh, a wine importer and distributor, um, and I think that's a big part of your activities. Uh, were you in the wine business before you were in the restaurant business? Yes, I have been in the wine business for the last uh, 12 to 15 years. Uh, before I was a, a professional skier, mm -hmm. I skied uh, many, many years, and um, and the skiing kind of uh, gave me an opportunity to have an open mind and travel the world mm -hmm. and then ultimately end up uh, here in Salt Lake City where I met Amy and we decided to make a family and, and a future together. I've been a, a wine lover and, and a collector for, for decades now and some of my absolute best wine experiences have been here in this restaurant and I, I know that that's a passion and the integration of the food and wine experience. You were recently got a Wine Spectator Award. Uh, the, the wine list you have in this restaurant is phenomenal. Although I choose never to read it, I just say, uh, Marco, pick the wines because that's always the best way to go when you come here. So, uh, so talk about wine and you know, your approach towards wine in the restaurant business. Utah in general is a very difficult state to run a successful wine program because of the state control that um, is definitely um, we put in a lot of effort and there are um, ways that the state allows you to uh, to be able to build a great wine list and since we opened it was always a, a mission uh, because we firmly believe that a restaurant experience is done by three components. Mm -hmm. You have the wine, you have the food, and you have the ambience. Mm -hmm. And the closer you get to excel at all three, the better the experience is. So the food uh, is all uh, from the region of Veneto. The ambience we recreated together, um, an extension of our living room. And so we went to work on a wine list that is now to about 500 wines and uh, we're able to collect uh, some of the greatest vintages and some of the greatest wines all around the country from a lot of different importers and be able to bring them to Utah. And um, so that we have a lot of customers that choose not to look at the wine list and the one they look at it, they are impressed and shocked because uh, they tell us all the time they feel like they are in a restaurant uh, on a Fifth Avenue in New York City because of the selection that we have. This is one of the things that make the whole experience um, like just kind of that peak experience is, for example, we were here, um, we were, had important business meeting uh, that we had from somebody who flew in from the East Coast and uh, Jeff and I uh, came and sat down and brought him to dinner. And I saw you like laboring at the end of the meal. And this is something I'll never forget. You're like, I got to get you a once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> and then you disappeared for a while. <laughs> you came out with this wooden box and you had this really special dessert wine. And then you explained to us how to drink the wine. And like you were, you had to swish it around in our mouth like it was mouthwash. But the explosion of, of chemicals in my brain <laughs> from, from that, and this was on top of a series of wines that led up to it. There's a sequence, and it's, there's a craft to not just saying, here's a, picking a nice bottle, but here's putting a sequence of wine together, food with the wine. Uh, you know, it all has to come together. It's like an art form. So tell me more of your philosophy around that. I believe that um, each wine is uh, almost like a color that, um, for a painter and you have this white canvas with each table and depending on the mood, even on the weather, depending on the day of the week, depending on understanding what the customer comes in and in what kind of state of mood, I have, it's my job, it's our job with, from start to finish here at Veneto to understand that in a matter of a few seconds and then cater an experience that goes from the food to the wine to the service. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not one table that is uh, like another one. And uh, sometimes it's very challenging, and, uh, but we, we push ourselves to, to, to give uh, that experience to each table. It's very customized. I mean, really, Marco is amazing at it for the whole experience, um, the food and the wine, but 
even as guests, you know, ask, what is your favorite? Well, there, if it wasn't one of our favorites, it would not be on the menu. Mm -hmm. But truly every table, I love that you put it that way, it is a blank canvas. Mm -hmm. And not one experience or night is going to be the same. Just the passion, you know, from the service flows through to the guest. What's your opinion as far as how much of the experience of the food is the chef and how much of it is the source ingredients that you're using? It's a great question. I think it's uh, uh, mostly is the ingredients. Um, the chef, the cooking, it's just a vehicle that uh, just brings it to the table. But I am a firm believer that ingredients are the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And with ingredients comes a way of being able to handle them and mm -hmm. pick them, uh, not rushing them. Uh, once you rush nature, mm -hmm. uh, you rush uh, a product that it's not true. Um, we all know even at home when you plant tomatoes and you fertilize too much and they grow too fast, they usually don't taste anything. Mm -hmm. and, and when you harvest them at the right time, they are very tasteful. Uh, here is the same thing. Um, we are very, very meticulous on um, what we put uh, together. Um, mm -hmm. The Italian cuisine is famous for not mixing more than three ingredients in the same dish at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, because once you add more than three, you are covering one other one. And so uh, why put an ingredient if uh, it doesn't, you don't taste it? There's a beauty in that simplicity with the food, yeah, rather than trying to make it overcomplicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, first off, guys, I want to just say thank you for, uh, personally for me and my wife, Lori, will, would say the same thing, for giving us uh, some of the best dining and wine experiences of our life. Uh, they're meaningful, they're, you know, they create memories, and you, know, you look back on them, they fill your heart. So uh, that, that's been wonderful. So thank you for that. And secondly, thanks for taking the time to sit and share all this with us. We love it. No, thank thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Well, are you feeling a little bit hungry and thirsty right now? I mean, how could you not? Look at the wisdom, look at the passion for the experience of wine and food and how it can be delivered to individuals and how it enriches our life. So I hope you got as much out of that interview as I did. I really enjoyed my time with them. So here's an area where I get contradictory information. Some people say white wine should be served chilled. Other people tell me that, oh, no, no, good white wine should be served at room temperature. What's the proper temperature to serve a white wine? So this is a multi-answer uh, because uh, the better the wine is, the more it needs to be closer to room temperature. Uh, the temperature of the wine, the colder it is, the more the wine will be closed, will not release all the aromas. And so it's very difficult to, to drink a very cold, very good white wine. Uh, the opposite, if a wine is so-and-so, is on the cheaper side, you want to maybe uh, chill it down a little bit more to cover some of the flaws. But on good white wine, I always recommend drink it at uh, 58 degrees, uh, almost like cellar temperature. When I first heard about Slovenian wines, it conjured up a lot of things, but none of it was great winemaking or much passion around it. As a matter of fact, I wasn't exactly sure where Slovenia was, I'm embarrassed to say. This is a part of our story in Wine Revealed that you're gonna find extremely enriching. Slovenia is a part of the old Yugoslavia and is near the Italy border. The reality is Slovenia, at least the part of Slovenia that we went to, Berta, shares a winemaking region with Italy. But it has a very interesting past. This winemaking region at times was Italy, at times was Yugoslavia, at times was and is now Slovenia. Based on what was going on in world politics and world wars, the battle lines or the border lines were drawn in different places. So imagine now that there are multi-generational farmers that live on this land and the land is a part of a different country over time as these vineyards are being passed along from generation to generation. The story behind Slovenia is amazing and the wines they produce are spectacular. What's interesting when we went there is that the current winemakers in Slovenia 
are the descendants of people who lived under communist Yugoslavia. And their fathers had taught them about making wine, but they were compelled by the government not to worry about quality wine, but to make volumes of wine. That was what winemaking was under a communist regime. However, there were these seeds that were planted in the hearts of these sons and daughters that basically said, there's something about the magic of winemaking that needs to persist. And one day when communism is over, maybe we can get back to producing wines that are of high quality, that are reflective of the land in which we grow these grapes and can speak to the world in a way that tells them the story about what it means to live on this land and to experience this land. So we flew into Venice, Italy, and we got in a car with an entire film crew, and we drove out to Slovenia, this area called Berda. And it is beautiful. It is lush. The people are amazing. It is one of the best trips I ever took in my life. And we're really excited to introduce you to these Slovenian wines. Certainly, I put a lot of them in my cellar now, and I enjoy them every time I open them. They're special, they're unique, they're different, they're world class. And they also tell a story about a land that has gone through a lot of changes over time. So the first interview I want to share with you is with a gentleman named Marco. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name because I'll butcher it. But Marco is the owner and winemaker at Dolfo Wines. And I have to tell you, walking his vineyards during the harvest, seeing his excitement and enthusiasm, and learning about his philosophy and his view of winemaking and the wine experience in total was something that brings a smile to my face every time I begin to even think about it. So. Enjoy this tour and this interview with Marco. Marco, you have a very beautiful property here. Some of your land is actually in Italy. Yes, uh, it's true. Thank you for the compliments. Yes, uh, really. Uh, the 25% vineyard of Dolfo Winery uh, rests in the Italy part. Uh, this is the three hectare and, and half. Mm -hmm. After the Second uh, War, uh, is the border uh, is going in this uh, land. Uh, and then this time uh, I have, uh, and my friends and the 25% of people of Slovenia rest in the Italy, Italy past, pa, uh, part. This is the true, but living, uh, living uh, okay, uh, yeah. but uh, rest. Uh, the land is the same, the area is the same, the quality is the same. It's not the change, the quality, but I have it in the Italy part. Yes, it's true. It's, and it's changed since your grandfather's time and then your father's time and your time, it's, it's changed the borders uh, three times? Yes, I, my father and grandfather living in the three diverse countries. Yeah. Incredible, my, yeah. it's true, but my, my grandfather started to Italy part. So it was Italy? After the Second War, yeah. war is to have the Italy here. Yeah. And uh, the Second War is coming to Yugoslavia ex-Yugoslavia, and I, in this, in this time, am living in Slovenian country. Wow. It's true, in three different countries, living three generations of Dolfo uh, winery. But as you said, nothing really changed uh, as far as the winemakers. It all stays the same. One thing is true. Uh, here, these people, my grandfather and another people is living here in Goriska Berda, uh, uh, is working very, very hard. Mm -hmm. This mentality is coming to my father, absolutely and to my uh, father is coming with me. And so the work is very hard. Uh, the story 
And the, very important for me is the to the generation to generation is coming the how fight the wine. Mm. The wine after is of the end is most important uh, thing. But I'm fighting here to 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 work the the uh, territory to uh, land. I'm very happy to stay here in this uh, sm very small piece of very nice wines in Gorish Cabernet. I know you do work very hard, uh, but this time of year, it's a, it's a very happy time, right? With the harvest, uh, that uh, now the grapes are coming off the vines. And, and you said to me earlier, you said, uh, this is where God's work ends and my work begins. So you hear all the, you know, the activity around us, you know, tractors and other things going by where people are, are starting to harvest the grapes. Yes, in this time in Gorishka Berda or here in uh, Medana in Ceglo is the uh, time of the harvest. It's every tractor is going and coming. But uh, yes, it's true. It's the best year, the best time of the year. Is harvest, is start. I I love uh, the, the 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 harvest because it's my important moment for uh, pick the grapes and then is coming the wine. This is the middle of the harvest. And uh, important in the moment in this time is uh, the hard work after uh, before uh, of, of land, vineyards, and this is amazing time. I love the, the grapes, I love the work in the wine cellar, and uh, I, absolutely I know this year is a very beautiful year. Uh, this, uh, the grapes is very sweet, uh, yeah. the, uh, good condition. Uh, really a uh, top year. What are the most important lessons you learned from your father? Uh, yes, it's, it's true. The generation before m my father uh, teach me f most important thing is the family. Absolutely, the, the respect uh, the land and have the wine with quality and extremely dry because you need to represent the territory in the my wines. This is three things most important uh, for me. Yes, yeah, so, so that uh, this land has a special quality that, uh, that the wine should have. Yes, this land uh, here in Gorishka Berda, you have the name, the local name of the, the stones is Opoka. Mm -hmm. The sand English stone. is the sand uh, stones. And uh, yes, it's, the, it's, the, it's very, very important because uh, the, the wine of Gorishka Berda or, and the Dorfa winery and the, my friends represent the territory. Uh, with minerality. Here have a lot of minerality and minerals in wines and this is for the wine uh, region mm -hmm. uh, very important for the consumer yes. of the wine because it have uh, represent the land and represent the taste uh, for, for, for the wine. Thank you, the, the generation before you defended this, this land for, for, for us we are here. Yes. And, uh what lessons will you teach your daughter? In the same times, uh, I hope, but is a little bit younger, and I hope going to my uh, my uh, shoes. Yeah. I am in the for the, my daughter every, every day and every hour in the available and the moment for teaching everything. What you what your questions uh, really? But you living here, and uh, she now a lot of uh, think in in this year. Yeah. What, what do you think about that you work here on this land so hard uh, in Slovenia, but uh, people all over the world now have Dolfo wine in their home and they drink it. Uh, do you feel connection? Oh yeah, oh this is uh, nice. Uh, I, I, I respect uh, the people, you, you, you buy my wine and I'm very happy because the wine is going uh, the other countries of the world and who have the my wine at home? You have the my spirit at your home, mm -hmm. and absolutely, I am I am here. I am everywhere. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, the idea though of the wine representing this soil, this land, right? It's important. So when other people experience it, it's like they visited uh, Berda. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. This is the the the, the catch of the moment. Uh, need the, the represent the minerality of this land, a the, 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 uh, lot of minerality, because the, the big area of the world with Bordeaux or Rioja or uh, Piemont mm -hmm. or Tuscany and California yeah. 
you have the special soil, the special taste and I hope in the future, one year or three or five years, I don't know, that the coming the Berda in this map of the best territory and the best crew of tasting of the world. This is the point because this soil and this, this, this wine and this uh, hard work uh, is, is mer merit this thing uh, to the map. The, the Berda is good mineral territory of, of world. Yeah. This is the point for, for every producer of Gorishka Berda. This is the way for the work. And uh, with the other people who make wine around here, we, do you get together and talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. In the first is the is the concurrent, yeah. but is the the, the 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 nice thing, you know. Mm. And uh, the, my friend here in area, yes, he speak a lot of wine, a lot of uh, you speak and tasting the yes. wine, and co communication is 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 very nice and friendly. But you need one and the other, because then it's going up the quality. Do you feel like uh, the quality of the wine from Berda, Slovenia is like a secret in the world that you want people to discover? Yes, it's, it's true. Uh, it's the, Slovenia is the new country, is the first, and uh, have the uh, beautiful position in the Europe. It's in the center of the Europe. It's very green country, a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Uh, here you have possibly to eat uh, fiki, trees, uh, cherries, uh, wine, uh, grapes, because it is very nice climatic mm -hmm. no? and is the new destination of wine. And the people uh, in the moment now where is Slovenia, you know where is the bird, but is the new is going very quickly up. Do you, what do you love most about wine? For the wine, I love only to think. The minerality yeah. and extremely, extremely dry wine. Yeah. Nothing sugar rest. Yeah. I love this wine. You love it that way? This steel of wine. Yes. Yes. What impact do you want wine to have on people's lives? I represent this wine, extremely dry and mineralic, and I hope you understand my, my job. Thank you. Thank you for the visit. Very important thing after is wind of Gorishka Berda. Mm -hmm. The name is Buria. Buria. This wind is coming here. And this is the beautiful thing. Now yes. the grapes love love the, the wind. They now. love the wind, huh? And this is the fresh area mm -hmm. of wind. The name is is, is Buria. Yeah. Buria. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. But, yeah. Me veseli. Še nikoli pred toliko nisem bil pred temi kamere mi. We say nice to meet you and uh, never say a lot of time to the uh, camera, uh, you know, <laughs> because it's, 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 it's the first time you look at the camera. You know? yeah. <laughs> That's good. Thank this you. Is, uh, my father, Dolfo, is the second generation of Dolfo winery and okay, I'm the third. Yeah. And you have a daughter who will be fourth generation. Yes. That's yes. good. Yes. Yeah, named Anna, yes. Hey. So where do they cut? Right on the top of the stem? Yes, important is not put the grapes in this for, from energy. Yes. You put the grapes beautiful. Gently. Black. Yeah. Elegance. Yes, elegance. And respect. Yes. For work, the wine. Yes, yes. And this for me is nice, no? But yes. is uh, necessary yeah. because every uh, thing is impossible to make to, to the get, shower. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and these vines are how old? The plants you have 25 years old, mm -hmm. and I hope you have about 56 years 50, old, 60. and then I change the, 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 the winners, yes, yes. Re renew. How long have you been working with these guys? About 10 or 11 years, stay here they're in here, the, my yeah, yeah. house. they here, yeah. yes. Is there an art to how they take the grapes? Is there a special way that they need to clip? It's just no, right on No, it's a, a very easy, important is to go to the very directly inside, to the grapes, no, and you put in the hands uh -huh. very soft. You need the pratic, no? Yeah. Absolutely, no? Yes. They have to work fast. Is of course yeah. I need the fast, not very very slow because then is the yeah. problems, no? Yeah. Die. Die. Wow, the grapes finally at home. You are so beautiful. I like uh, work to 
to juice with you. <laughs> the quality is perfect. Yellow maturity. Wow, this year the wine is perfect. Patrick, look this yeah. material yeah. is the gold. 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 The gold. I like this. <laughs> wow. Excited. Finally, we go to start. Yes. Marco, uh, we have two white grapes here, yes? Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's true. Here is uh, half in the my vineyards, have the Ribola Jala. And, and this the, is the bigger one? This is Ribola here? Yeah, yeah, it's the bigger grapes. In this moment, it's not, not ready. yet ready mm -hmm. because it's the maturity of these grapes about 15 mm -hmm. uh, of, of September and it's not prepared for the harvest, no? Mm -hmm. Because you look at the, the berries, mm -hmm. no? And then it's very green. Oh, yeah. So it's green. Is it not prepared for the harvest? And then it's coming out. You work this grapes ribola in this moment. It's coming out mm -hmm. very not uh, nice wine, very acidity and not balanced. What color should it be? Brown? Yes. But in this time, mm -hmm. in this time to uh, the end of August, I'm starting uh, to harvest the Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Is, uh, and these are the smaller grapes here. Small grapes in the, the, the small uh, 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 skins. Yes. No? But is this, in this time of, of, of August, end of August, is mature. No? But you, you look at the, mm -hmm. the skins. And those are brown, like the other one. Yeah. The, the taste is very sweet, mm -hmm. acidity is is very very low and this is for me mm -hmm. the signal for the start the, the 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 harvest the chardonnay so do you you come out in the morning and taste to decide uh, the grapes to decide when to pick them yes absolutely i need uh, two information the the, the the best information or mm -hmm. the most important information is the taste my yes. taste yes in the months because here i now minerality uh, acidity uh, sugar mm -hmm. absolutely i need something uh, to work the small analyst only with uh, ph and and uh, sugar and acidity but this is the information for all all vineyards yeah but the the the, the last talk and the last uh, start for the harvest is the my months taste yes. in my months yeah. and in the end that's it starts with just what you taste and then you bring people in and they have to cut absolutely. very quickly huh? yeah yeah so if we put these next to each other so this this uh, here is the uh, ribula, yes. Yes. And this is unique Slovenian uh, this is the white variety. Ribula is the autochtonic sorts of Goriška Brda, not yeah. only Slovenia, only in this area. In this area, yes, Slovenia. Yes, in Goriška yeah. Brda, is have the ribola, or maybe a little bit near uh, Nova Gorica. But here is the crew, really crew, ribola of Goriška Brda. This is the only uh, uh, half here. This yes. uh, this these grapes is the autochtonic sorts of, of this land. And the Ribola, you need the, uh, the position of top of the hills yes. because uh, you have need the opoca or, or, or soil is the very important for the, for, the, for the taste and minerality of after, after the harvest, after the fermentation in the wine, you need the minerality. So it has to be on top of the hill on top and that's of the where you have more minerality. Yes. And then, and then, and uh, then, you plant them right next to the Chardonnay. So, uh, so you uh, you will take some of these grapes, but leave these at the same time because this takes longer. Yes, you need longer because it's the bigger yeah. and uh, mature it about 15 of uh, September, and uh, is the thick skins. Yes, is, uh, thicker skin. Is, uh, yes, is um, uh, more, and you need more time. And uh, the Ribola is 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 uh, the most important thing of Gorishka Berda because about 35 percent is the uh, the grapes in uh, Barda have the ribola now this is this is much more yellow and gold will this turn that color yeah. absolutely you yeah. have uh, more time tell me about the the soil what is special about the soil yes in the gorishka Barda is uh, very uh, interesting the uh, terroir is the uh, the name of in slovenian language or local language is opoka Mm -hmm. Saint Stone. Saint Stone. Yes, is very important for all of the wine of region. Uh, I need this min minerality because the Saint Stone you, you come in the in the grapes and after in the wine the minerality of wine have so much 
uh, full. And this so is unique uh, to the soil in Slovenia? Yes, unique. Yeah. Uh, Mandat in Slovenia is very special area, is micro location, is Goriška Brda. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Goriška Brda, we have this. Uh, so, the, this region yes, of Slovenia, this region, just this one region, okay. uh, is one of the uh, uh, important uh, region of minerality in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, this region, you put a lot of minerality in the wine. And you look, is this the, the soil? Look. Oh, uh, yeah. And this stones very small yes. inside and uh, uh, inside of the uh, radici of, of the grapes, mm -hmm. two or three meters now in the in the in the ground, you have a lot of minerality and then you're coming to the to it the grapes. To the this grapes. is the most important thing of wine from minerality, important micro location mm -hmm. and I'm very happy because my grandfather is fighting for here, for this land, yeah. and I'm here enjoy the product and enjoy the wine. So this, yeah. and this is special to you because your grandfather had to fight to get this land, and uh, and now you are third generation. Yes, it's true. And you're enjoying. Absolutely, the I'm the third generation. Thank you, grandfather and father. I'm here and I work hard. Yeah. Uh, I work uh, very very hard, but uh, the result and enjoy for the work and for the for the grace because it's uh, nice and and I like this this work. I am in spirit inside of this work and yes. uh, uh, I enjoy really really well, enjoy of the work this wine. What's interesting is now that I'm meeting you. Before I ever knew I was coming here, I have your wine in my wine cellar. Really? Yes. Uh, so uh, so I've been enjoying it before I even knew any of this. Wow! You have. In your house, my spirit inside, because where is the my wine and your home, my spirit is with them. And I, I'm feeling that now. So when I go back to drink the wine, uh, I'm going to have a different experience with it now because I've seen the soil. You know I've everything, grapes, uh, and I've met you. <laughs> thank you. Well, talk about passion and talk about brand purity. That's what Marco brings to Dolfo Wines, and I have to tell you that was an amazing experience for me, and I hope it was for you too. What's the proper temperature for red wine to be served? Uh, red wine is, it should be stored at usually 58, 60 degrees, um, cooler temperature. And uh, the way that I like always is to keep it on the colder side as you open the bottle and then let the wine warm up to a room temperature as uh, you drink the bottle. So you also see a little bit of the evolution. So when you're uh, consuming it, you want it uh, basically at room temperature? At room at temperature, point. yes. Well, that concludes episode one of Wine Revealed. I encourage you to share this with friends, share it with family. The free viewing period is going on right now. We're in the beginning of this entire process. Now's a great time to share. The joy that Wine Revealed will bring is something that is special and unique. So please do share it. Thanks for spending this time with me and I look forward to seeing you in episode two. You are in Podere Le Ripi. For me, that is a very special place. It's not just a winery, for me it's an habitat. An habitat for wine, but also for people. For many, many years, making wine in Montalcino, it's been everyday life. If you visit a winery in Montalcino, for us, it's very important that you understand that first in a winemaker, you need to be a farmer. What we want is show to the people in the glass of wine, his personality that is just about the land. There was something in me about wine that I wanted to, to learn more, mm -hmm. and I did the sommelier course. Yeah. Wine is very simple. When I explain wine, I try to use simple words all the time. I mean, wine has a soul. Mm -hmm. Behind the glass, there is a long story. It's so magic, because th there are many things involved. The land, the terroir, the atmosphere, the whole environment mm -hmm. around them. And when you open the bottle, the story begins. Yeah. It's not the end, uh -huh. it's just the beginning. Uh -huh.